Hello and welcome back to our third in a series of fact checks done by the University of Montana School of Journalism. My name is Lee Bamble. I'm a professor of journalism here at the university. And with me tonight are students from our elections reporting class, as well as my colleague, Dennis Swivel. Good evening, Dennis. Good evening. Uh, I have a question for you right off the bat here, Lee, tonight. They both talked a bit about uh, uh, how they might uh, deal with uh, uh, an arrangement of things, uh, taxes, jobs, economy, and COVID. Uh, what did you think out of that uh, uh, con conglomeration of issues was particularly interesting? Yeah, so there were a lot of uh, claims that, that kind of went back and forth that dealt both with like the health issues connected with COVID and the economic issues. Um, starting first with the health issues, uh, Lieutenant Governor Mike Cooney really focused on that and said that, you know, this is a continuing health crisis. You know, today we saw, uh, again, uh, a new record broken by the state of Montana in terms of, of, of new infections. Um, and hospitals have expressed concern about um, their systems not being able to handle uh, possible influxes of patients. And so he really chose to focus on the, the sort of health questions uh, that COVID raises. Um, and in particular, took took uh, Congressman Gianforte to task over his stated opposition to the Affordable Care Act or the Obamacare Act. Um, he pointed to the, the, the likely Supreme Court hearing uh, early next month where the Supreme Court may weigh in and actually uh, rule the Affordable Care Act uh, unconstitutional, which would then essentially nullify the law. And what he said, which is true, is Montana's Medicaid expansion which currently uh, offers insurance to somewhere between 90 and 92,000 Montanans um, would be in jeopardy if that Affordable Care Act is struck down. It's made possible by and largely funded by the federal government through the Affordable Care Act. And so Congress could step in and do another thing if, if it's struck down. There have been a couple of proposals that really haven't gone anywhere in Congress to, to tackle some of this, but it is true that the Affordable Care Act does make Medicaid expansion possible. And, and the, the efforts of, of some within the Republican Party to have the Supreme Court overturn it, including the Trump administration, um, would put, put that system in jeopardy. On the other hand, uh, Congressman Gianforte really focused on the economic questions and said that this is all about uh, bringing the Montana economy back. He talked about 150,000 jobs lost. He talked about people continuing to sit, uh, file for um, uh, chapter 11 bankruptcy, small businesses in particular. And he really pointed to his plan, uh, which uh, he, he says is his sort of reopening plan for Montana. And that really focuses on two areas. One is to really uh, rein in and limit the amount of, of state government agency oversight. So getting permits for uh, certain environmental uh, impacts of businesses and things like that. And he said his first thing will be to kind of go through and really um, strip out a lot of that, those, those uh, regulations so that um, we can really make it, make it a better environment for business. Um, and the other thing he focused on was to really restructure Montana's tax policy to um, be more entrepreneur friendly, more uh, small business friendly. And it's true, we, we did some digging and we found a couple things. One is, um, so Montana's perception uh, nationwide when you rank states based on business friendliness and tax policies, um, it, you, you see a lot of variation. So the, the Fairly Libertarian uh, Tax Foundation, which is really you know, focused on kind of minimizing the tax uh, impact on people actually ranks Montana as, as fifth best in the country, uh, in particular because we don't have a sales tax, but also um, some of our other sort of taxes around corporate income and personal income and property taxes are sort of better compared to others. But I also found a CNBC report that really focused on um, sort of entrepreneur and business development, and that actually ranked us 33rd. So like there is it appears to be some room for improvement to kind of create more opportunity zones for, for smaller businesses to expand. But it's a question of, you know, if you, if you cut those taxes there, can you keep the other tax structures at places like the tax foundation like as low as they are now? Or are you gonna have to reduce the services that people are counting on? Um, but it wasn't just COVID that, that we talked about. Um, we also talked about some other uh, pretty hot button issues. Um, and guns came up, right? Uh, in particular, with a focus on um, so-called concealed carry and whether you need to have a permit to carry 
a concealed weapon or whether you should be allowed to do that. I'm curious what you found once you guys, and these guys, started digging into those facts. What, what kind of rang true and what might be sort of political more than real? Yeah, both candidates were asked a pretty specific question to start off this exchange. And it was, that, it was whether they would uh, uh, veto a bill that would uh, allow you to get a permit uh, to get a concealed weapon, uh, to carry concealed weapons without a permit, I'm sorry. Uh, and Cooney said uh, he, would, uh, uh, he would not support a request for that. And that's very much in, uh, in line with what Governor Bullock uh, has a stance he has taken. I think he, uh, in fact, vetoed exactly the same bill in 2017 uh, that would require this. Uh, that's something we were able to find. Uh, uh, and he and Cooney's uh, argument was that uh, law enforcement, which is uh, one of his, uh, uh, he says, part of the, the, the group that supports him uh, in this campaign is, is, is opposed to that because that allows them some uh, method to kind of keep an, keep an eye on people that are uh, 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 carrying concealed weapons and, and having some sort of check on that. Gian Forti, on the other hand, said that uh, he would support that. He would sign that, that bill. Uh, he also talked again about his, uh, as he has in past debates, about his A plus rating with the NRA uh, to carry kind of guns. Uh, that, then there was a question about, you know, what uh, kind of ammunition or kinds of guns uh, would each candidate uh, object to? And, uh, and uh, Cooney really didn't answer that question uh, very uh, uh, clearly. Uh, but you said that we needed to, to, to look at the safety of our communities, so which, which is consistent with, with what, the, what he and Governor Bullock had done all these years. Uh, and GM40 said he would uh, support that. He also accused, I think, uh, uh, Cooney of uh, uh, supporting uh, the, you know, bans on high capacity magazines and, and things like that. So there's a real stark difference between the two in terms of, of the Second Amendment. Uh, and uh, while the, although Cooney is in, like Bullock says, I am for you know, uh, gun ownership, I own guns, I've always owned guns, uh, I think they're important, uh, but we also uh, need to look out for the safety our, of our communities. That's essentially uh, where uh, Cooney came down. And I mean, basically, he made that argument using the police union support, right, as right. sort of stamp of approval that it's not that I, you know, I'm not another Democrat who hates all guns. Well, and, and this is a longstanding position, I think, that comes from uh, uh, Governor Bullock's time as Attorney General, too, uh, in Montana. He had the, the top, top policeman, essentially, in the state as Attorney General, and law enforcement community uh, had a lot to say about a lot of these gun details. I found a, an article uh, today from 2018 that, that looked at a survey that said since 1999, uh, there have been 94 bills uh, dealing with guns, uh, and uh, 94 of those bills were about loosely uh, loosening restrictions on guns uh, in Montana. And uh, so there's a real trend toward that. And every legislative session, we see more guns uh, are trying to do that. In fact, on our ballot right now is, is LR-130, which would, which would uh, prevent local governments from having restrictions that were uh, uh, stronger, more stringent than the state would allow. Uh, on those areas, uh, particularly with guns in, in, in public uh, buildings. So uh, yeah, it's an issue that uh, will be around for a long time. So uh, Lee, he, the, among the other sort of issues they discussed was, uh, or GN40 raised, was teacher salaries. And he's done this in, in a couple of debates now, uh, saying that Montana teacher salaries are particularly low and that's a problem. What did you find out about his claims about teacher salaries? Right, and it wasn't just that they're low, we're dead last. That's what the, the phrase was, dead last and starting teacher pay. Uh, and we did do some digging and it does uh, pan out that actually Montana is in fact 51st uh, in starting teacher pay, um, averaging around uh, $30,000 uh, for a starting teacher, $30,036. Um, but then you, uh, you were very close to other states like Missouri, which is 31.8 and Oklahoma, which uh, is 31.9. Um, and so it is true that Montana starting teacher salaries are uh, significantly lower than you'll see in other places. Um, and, and so his critique of, you know, there's something happening where money is moving from the state to uh, two schools and aren't making it into the classroom 
you know, that, that might be true. One thing we didn't have uh, time to confirm was how do we stack up an amount of money directed from the state to schools? So is, is this a, you know, is there a lot of money going into schools and not making it into teachers' pockets? Or is it, there's not a lot of money going into the schools and therefore it's not going into teachers' pockets. But uh, we did confirm that fact. The other thing though to note is when you look at average teacher salaries. So you started teaching, you, you, you're, you're uh, you know, been working for several years. Um, what is the average teacher making in the state of Montana? Well, that number turns out to be uh, quite a bit different. Uh, that number is about $51,400, which is significantly higher than the average uh, Montanan uh, job earner. Um, and it puts us around 27th, so in terms of teacher salary. So we're not super high, but, but when you look at average teacher salary, we're not in the basement like we are in terms of the starting salary. And so, um, you know, when you're looking at, you know, is this a good place to be a teacher? Well, it looks like the first couple of years might be a little bit dicey, but it seems like there's a trajectory where your salary can kind of move into sort of more normal sort of average for the, for, uh, the entire country. Um, and so that's what we found out there. Uh, another thing that they seem to not be getting along about, uh, and there were a couple moments where this thing got a little, little cranky, uh, was about public lands, which we hear about almost every election. Um, but this one focused specifically on this idea of these wilderness study areas. So I'm curious, uh, so uh, uh, Lieutenant Governor Cooney accused Greg Gianforte of trying to, to basically shuff off like 700,000 acres of, of pristine Montana wilderness. Um, what are these things? Is that true? Um, yeah, what did we find out? Well, this has been an issue that, that has uh, been occupying Montana news pages and debates all across the state for, for decades now. Actually, uh, in the 70s, when the, the, we passed a wilderness uh, a bill, they've set aside a bunch of land and said, we're going to study this for inclusion in wilderness or, or not, and, and maybe other kinds of uses and so forth. And we're still uh, uh, struggling with that decision on what to do. So. So GN Forte introduced a, a couple of bills in 2018 uh, to uh, take those uh, areas uh, that were designated uh, and uh, are, have a review of them in some ways, but also just uh, uh, release that land back to sort of uh, public sort of decisions and uh, public projects. And uh, that uh, there's a, a companion bill that uh, Senator Steve Daines has introduced in the Senate too. So this is, uh, you know, high on the list of a lot of the conservation uh, groups in the state, and also a lot of uh, ag groups that are, and some local government groups that are interested in having these decisions uh, made finally uh, after all these years. Uh, but you know, it, it has been a difficult debate. It has been one where you found that there was, a, you know, extreme differences uh, between the conservation community and between local ranchers and ag groups about a lot of these areas. And there have been some pretty heated meetings across the state. It never seems to die down. And although we've been talking about this for a long time, uh, these two bills that GN40 introduced kind of kicked it off again. And there were some uh, pretty hot meetings in Lewistown and some other places about some of the particular areas that were included in these wilderness study areas uh, that might come out. So, you know, uh, the, 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 one of the complaints was that uh, this, uh, these bills seem to come without hearings. Uh, they came to uh, the, these communities uh, as almost, uh, you know, uh, things that, here, what do you think of this? You know, uh, and, and that Danes had, had sort of hand-selected groups of people to come and talk about this, including county commissioners. Uh, and that really rubbed conservationists the wrong way. They said the way to sort of make these decisions is entirely on the local level with stakeholders from all the different communities meeting and coming up with sort of a local uh, home cooking on on how this thing should be put together, and that was that was what they sort of decided. Uh, and there's also some politics going on uh, on the at the state delegation about all of these things. Uh, John Tester has a has a bill to the Black Creek uh, Clearwater uh, Stewardship Act. It really is a, one of these uh, efforts to deal with wilderness study area, uh, and uh, it kind of came from the grassroots, and that's the approach. Uh, that he wants to take, and it seems like you know uh, Congress is really sort of suspicious of 
uh, uh, signing off on any of these if the state's delegation doesn't come up with any sort of agreement. So yeah, we have been arguing about these things for a long time. It never really seems to get it off the dime, but trying to come up with local solutions that people can agree on uh, has, has, is increasingly difficult, it seems. So we have, a, I think, a final uh, thing we uh, had a chance to take a look at tonight, and that was one of the most animated uh, parts of the, of the evening, and uh, where they talked about uh, their stands on abortion. Uh, right. And, uh, and uh, they have some uh, very diametrically opposed stances here, and perhaps you could talk about how that exchange went. Yeah, so this was probably the, the most uh, animated we saw uh, Lieutenant Governor Cooney get. Um, you know, it, it was definitely one of the areas where Greg Gianforte uh, kind of came out very strong about a very specific piece of legislation. And this was, it's called the uh, Born Alive Infant Protection Act. Um, and he accused the Bullock and uh, uh, Cooney administration of vetoing this thing and putting infants who had somehow survived an, a botched abortion, um, that they wouldn't be provided health care um, unless this act was passed. And it was passed by the legislature uh, along a fairly uh, party line vote um, and went to the governor's desk and he vetoed it. Um, and so Greg Gianforte said, this is, this is a, you've created this danger for these infants who have survived this, this horrible incident. Um, and Mike Cooney got very angry and said that that's misleading, that this is, that I'm not pro-abortion, that I'm pro a woman's right to talk to her doctor about her health care, and that that should be seen as different. And bringing up this act is, is a cheap shot, is, is not accurate, that you're, you're creating a fiction that, that seems uh, beyond the pale. And so when we did dig into it, there is a law, or there was a bill, Senate Bill 354, which was the Montana Born Alive Infant Protection Act that was passed um, in the last legislature. Um, and the governor did veto it. Um, but we dug up the veto uh, text to kind of see, well, what, what was it? Why did they veto it? And if I can read here, it says, Senate Bill 354 is a reflection of divisive national debate that has little to do with the health of infants or women. Federal law, already provides for protections and medical care of, for infants. There's a Born Alive Infants Protection Act of 2002, a federal law that covers this situation. And so Montana passing a law that is either identical or similar um, is, is not actually really addressing an issue that, that is outside the purview of the law. There's already a law in the books, a federal law that would trump a, a state law anyway, that creates this sort of safety net for this really rare situation. And so when Mike Cooney says this isn't a thing in Montana, well, because the federal law exists that does address this, that's true. There is, this isn't a situation that, would, that should develop here because there is a federal law that specifically addresses this situation. But it does speak to how these two men really do differ on the question of abortion. I mean, Greg Gianforte was very clear. He's like, I'm pro-life. I've always been pro-life. I believe in the sanctity of, 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 of life. Um, and, and Mike Cooney kind of stating very clearly as well, this is a healthcare issue that, that women should have the right to talk to their healthcare providers to find solutions. And really, you're, Greg Gianforte, proposing big government get involved, um, which is pretty classic uh, sort of arguments around abortion. But this specific law um, was already hashed out at the federal level before the 2019 law uh, kicked in. Um, and I think, I mean, there were lots of other things uh, but, you know, there are only so many checks, facts we can check in a given time period. Uh, and so I think that that will sort of do us for 2020 in our editions of Fact Checks. Um, obviously, uh, we would encourage all the viewers that if you are suspicious of our Fact Checks, or certainly if you are suspicious of what the candidates said, to go dig around uh, and try to find this information on your own. You know, demand sort of citations from the campaigns so that they can back out their claims and so that you can, you can tell the facts. You can fact check this stuff as well. Uh, you can fact check us. Um, and so uh, I wanna thank uh, Dennis for joining me for, for these three fact checks over the course of these three uh, public broadcasting debates, as well as the students from the elections reporting class of 2020. Um, and we look forward to, you know, as of Friday, people will start getting their ballots. And so we encourage you to vote uh, and uh, we'll have more here from the University of Montana over the coming weeks. So Dennis, thanks and good night.
Thank you. Good night.